Um, I'm Sudeshna Das. G uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, here, uh, an associate professor at Mass General Brigham Hospital and uh, and Harvard Medical School. I am a, a, a data scientist by training, and my research interest is in the uh, uh, and Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And I lead the ADRD uh, pilot core of uh, the Mass AITC. And today, uh, our uh, webinar is going to be focused on large language models, which have uh, uh, generated quite a bit of excitement. And these are proving to be uh, transformative tools uh, for a whole uh, host of applications, including supporting individuals uh, with uh, ADRD and their caregivers. So by uh, leveraging these AI technologies, uh, mm, um, there have been several uh, pilots that are using these uh, technologies. And today you'll hear from two of our uh, GY2 uh, pilots. The first talk will be uh, by Dr. Archana Bhadia. She's a research in scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. She'll be talking about uh, the development of my words an AI enhanced, uh, uh, specifically LLM enhanced application designed to assist individuals with ADRD by providing real-time word retrieval support and, and personalized uh, training for, uh, for, uh, for uh, with that app. The second talk uh, will be uh, delivered by uh, Rich Curtis, who is a, a VP of Pr product development at Ripple Care. And he'll be talking on the integration of advanced uh, technol AI technologies into the Kinto uh, platform, uh, which is a service designed to support family and caregivers of individuals uh, with living with ADRD. So with that, I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Bhatia. So uh, please take it away. All right. All right, you see my slides, right? All right. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about uh, the work on integrating large language models and other uh, AI technologies in an intelligent cognitive assistant that we are developing for word retrieval support for older adults with ADRD. Um, this work is uh, being um, conducted uh, with collaboration between the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, Northeastern University, and the University of California, Irvine. And these are the team members um, uh, working on the application. Um, so uh, we know that there are cognitive changes um, associated with normal aging. Uh, for example, uh, the processing speed may uh, go down, memory capacity may reduce, and there are some other cognitive changes also that happens with normal aging. But with ADRD, these changes are even more pronounced. Um, so uh, basically, um, so for example, processing speed uh, is much, much more uh, impacted with ADRD than it is with normal aging and the same thing with memory also for both long term and short term. Uh, so these can have an impact on word retrieval. Um, in, uh, for example, the, uh, it takes longer time to retrieve the words. Um, and also, uh, they may be more frequent tip of the tongue uh, states. And the mechanism behind this uh, kind, uh, these kinds of word retrieval issues uh, is likely that the connections between the lexical items and their semantics may weaken um, as a result of aging and ADRD. So, uh, and these uh, kinds of changes can have emotional and social impact on the individuals. Um, for example, with word retrieval difficulties, uh, we can see that it can lead to frustrations, distress, embarrassment, uh, sometimes withdrawal from social interactions. Uh, in fact, there are studies, for example, this is an NIH uh, um, uh, funded study where they found that word finding difficulty was an important predictor for social activity engagement um, and that they were uh, inversely correlated. Um, and uh, so such withdrawal from social interactions, they can lead to uh, greater isolation, depression, anxiety, 
uh, even cognitive decline. And as a result, it increases the caregiver burden. Uh, so it is important to provide uh, tailored support for uh, impact on language uh, of uh, ADRD, et cetera. Um, so uh, just to uh, reiterate, uh, normal aging and ADRD both involve changes in language processing and word retrieval. Uh, but the extent and impact of uh, the, these changes are far more severe in ADRD, leading to significant communication challenges, uh, which underscores the need for supportive tools and strategies. But these uh, supportive tools and strategies are not sufficient. Um, uh, for example, uh, there's this um, uh, another study which uh, looked at, uh, basically they suggested that a better understanding of word retrieval profiles can actually help improve interpretation of neuropsychological profiles um, associated with AD variants. So that suggests that there may be variability in language impairment across ADRD. Uh, so that underscores tailored linguistic support. So it's not just that uh, general uh, support would be sufficient. We actually want to provide tailored support to each individual. And that's what our application, My Words, is designed to do. Uh, it's, basic, it's being designed to provide targeted support for individuals depending on their unique needs. So what is this application? As I mentioned, it is basically an intelligent cognitive assistant uh, application for word retrieval support. It has these three modes of interaction uh, between the user and the application. Uh, data entry, where the user can actually input the data into the application. Uh, assistance mode, where the user can ask the application to provide information that they are looking for. Uh, or the words that they are forgetting. And then uh, training mode is uh, basically planned so that we could help strengthen the connections that have gotten weakened between the, uh, weaker between the uh, uh, lexical items and the concepts, associated concepts. Uh, so the two main goals of this um, application are uh, to quickly find the word a user needs at a particular moment and uh, optionally to train the user to better recall the word in the future. So, and the targeted audiences uh, or population is uh, elderly individuals with ADRD. Uh, so our application adopts a user-centered design approach. Uh, basically it has a participatory, uh, it involves a participatory design process, which involves iterative feedback and the stakeholders are involved in stages so that we could get feedback from them. And then uh, we also conduct usability testing and uh, feedback collection, which influences the design and functionality of the application. So what do I mean by uh, involvement of uh, stakeholders in stages? Um, so here we have these uh, uh, different stages. So first we have uh, initial testing and uh, iterative refinement, which we conducted with the development team members and some knowledgeable uh, colleagues. Uh, so basically it involves several iterations of testing and feedback to ensure uh, that the fundamental functionalities uh, were robust and to, uh, to meet the basic design specifications. Uh, then currently, uh, we um, our validation testing is ongoing with uh, normal control subjects, where also we have uh, iterative refinement and we are collecting feedback from the uh, participants. Um, sorry, so the feedback, uh, basically we are collecting feedback, qualitative and quantitative data on user interaction, ease of use, and initial impressions to guide further adjustments in the application. And eventually we will uh, do targeted feedback uh, collection uh, from slightly impaired uh, subjects. And uh, basically the feedback would be uh, regarding, um, sorry, uh, Oops. Uh, regarding accessibility, additional supportive features that they may require and the effectiveness of user interface. So based on the testing that we have conducted so, so far and the ongoing testing, we have actually refined the application. Um, uh, here I'm giving some examples of the common issues were, uh, that were identified and the features, inspired features that were uh, incorporated into the application. 
so for example, capability to assess a response or undoing and changing an assessment and filter and order, uh, order the responses based on the relevance and confidence uh, based on the assessment provided by the participants. Um, uh, here are a few more, uh, for example, default data entry format was selected, visual presentation was refined based on the uh, feedback we uh, received from the participants. Accessibility, for example, labels of modes of interaction were changed and uh, we updated the method for editing prior information and there are many other refinements that were made uh, based on user fee uh, feedback. Uh, so we expect that this uh, uh, user-centered de uh, design, uh, basically participatory design where we are collecting um, users' preferences and uh, uh, requirements um, and incorporating them into this application, we expect that this will help in user adoption and engagement. Uh, that's something to be tested, but we uh, that's what uh, we are expecting as a result of this participatory design uh, process. Uh, so uh, let's look at the user interface for my words. Uh, so it's uh, it's like a chat uh, or texting um, uh, app, um, apps that we normally see in mobile phones. Uh, so uh, here we have the data entry uh, mode where the user can enter the information into the application so that the application knows a little bit about the user. Uh, so uh, users can enter the information in a guided format where uh, there are uh, preset questions that users can respond to, or they can provide free form information. It could be a sentence, paragraph, words, phrases, and so on or it could be in a specific format that the user wants the information in. So for example, this, if they want the information to be in this format, they can select verbatim, for example, here. Um, and um, here we have the assistance mode where the user can ask the question about a word that they are trying to uh, retrieve from their memory. And uh, they could ask uh, complete sentences. So for example, here we have a question, they could just mention a phrase or a word uh, or anything, and then uh, the assistant is going to try to uh, find the relevant response. Sometimes users may want to provide feedback that this is a very bad response or a good response, or they may want to change the entries that they provided earlier. So they can do that by just selecting the entry that they are trying to change or uh, provide feedback on. Um, and the platform for our user interface is uh, the FITL platform that our team has been building uh, for applications for uh, uh, elderly uh, participants, elderly users. And uh, so we adapted that platform for our application uh, to develop our application. Uh, let's now uh, go to the natural language processing components. Um, so let's look at that a little bit. So natural language processing is that really important? Uh, that actually plays a very critical role in uh, making the app respond to the users appropriately. So uh, for example, it processes users' messages, whether these are data entries or the questions that they are asking the application. It extracts information and stores it in user databases retrieves the relevant information from the database and then generates a response to send to the user. Um, so there are these three main technologies, natural language technologies that are involved in our application. And this is besides the regular pre-processing like uh, tokenization, lemmatization, and so on. Um, but these are the three main technologies that we are using. So first, uh, keyword matching, where simple keywords, et cetera, are matched between the queries and the uh, data entries. Then we have graph matching and parsing, which utilizes syntactic structure and syntactic context. And for this, we are actually using uh, an in-house parser uh, called TRIPS, which basically analyzes, uh, um, does sy syntactic and semantic analysis of the utterances and then provides uh, logical forms. So we get the input uh, out output uh, of the parsing, uh, this parsing, and that's used in uh, developing our graph matching and parsing technology. Um, and then we use large language models uh, where uh, pre-trained linguistic knowledge is leveraged. 
So uh, uh, while talking about involving generative large language models, I want to talk about these two things. One, the role of generative large language models in our application, my words, and the challenges and solutions in integrating these models in real-time interaction in the application. So let's start with the role of generative uh, models, uh, large language models in my words. So I'll uh, give a few examples from our uh, application. Uh, so first here, we have this uh, tagging feature in our user interface where the user can actually provide uh, add tags to the data entries that they have uh, provided earlier. And this is actually utilized when uh, we do further processing to come up with an appropriate response. Um, due to their pre-training, these large language models may be able to infer such tags and then come up with appropriate response to the users. Uh, and they can actually also generate such tags, which can then be further used with other processing that we have already set up. Um, uh, here's another uh, feature in our user interface, which is flexible formatting of data entries that I'd mentioned earlier. So this formatting uh, users may use to indicate some relationships. For example, in this case, maybe I'm talking about the people I met in these countries, or maybe I'm talking about my friends from these countries. So large language models actually may be able to infer such relationships um, and uh, then generate text. So responses leveraging this inferred information. Um, then uh, here's another feature that I'd mentioned earlier, also feedback capabilities that the users can uh, provide feedback to the responses that are generated by the application, by the assistant in the application. Uh, so as these responses uh, or feedback, as this feedback accumulates over time for users, uh, large language models actually may be able to identify patterns for user preferences and then accordingly generate responses to. Uh, so these are some of the things that, um, some of the features that we already have, which large language models can actually um, help uh, in um, incorporating into the uh, response generation uh, and um, extraction of relevant information uh, part of the pipelines. Um, so before I talk about uh, the challenges with large language models, though, um, I want to talk about our pipeline um, uh, a little bit. So we actually have a tiered structure. So instead of having everything together, we actually first run just uh, keyword matching. If that reduces a response, then processing ends and the response is sent to the user. If uh, that does not uh, produce a response, we move on to graph matching and parsing. If that produces a, an appropriate response, then that's sent to the user. Otherwise, we move on to the large language model. So we are not really involving large lang language models from the very beginning. We actually have uh, uh, other processing before that, and there is a reason for that, and I'll talk about that. But before that, looking at the pipeline, so in this flowchart, so don't worry about the uh, all the details here, but basically what I want to say is that uh, uh, we have this sequential uh, application of uh, the three steps that I mentioned earlier. So keyword matching, the benefit of keyword matching is that uh, the response is uh, almost immediate, it's in instantaneous. So as soon as the uh, query is submitted, the response could be generated, um, almost. Um, and then if that doesn't come up with a good match, then we move on to graph matching, uh, where which is also relatively uh, quick in producing a response, uh, but it also uses additional contextual information besides keywords, so the responses are more informed. Um, in this case. Um, and if that also does not come up with a good match or uh, doesn't uh, come up with a match, then we move on to large language models. And uh, for these, the prompts actually are generated using the parsing information, which was uh, already uh, performed in the previous step. Um, but uh, it also, uh, this step also leverages pre-trained linguistic knowledge of these large language models, but it takes much longer time to respond. So that is one of the challenges in involving large language models, uh, especially if we are focused on an application where we need real-time um, uh, feedback, uh, response from the application. So let's... Uh, uh, talk a little bit about the challenges and solutions, some of the challenges and solutions with integrating large language models into my words. 
so first of all, uh, we know that, um, so our, uh, it's a, a vulnerable population. So we want to make sure that the privacy and security of the user data is uh, maintained. Um, and so that means we cannot use a public model like uh, ChatGPT in this case. Uh, so we want to have a model that we can have a private instance of, that we can download and uh, have uh, locally available. Um, so that was one of the um, design uh, choices that we had to make because of this requirement that we want to make sure that privacy and security are maintained. And also uh, we know that larger models are resource intensive. So we um, actually uh, went with a quantized version of a Mistral 7 billion parameters model and developed a, a, a version of our application which runs on a CPU server. Uh, so here we have uh, the Fittle uh, platform uh, for uh, the interface, and then we have trips parsing and quantized large language model, which runs on this. Uh, but the disadvantage of this is that the responses are very slow, and the quantized versions can make more errors than uh, full model versions. Uh, so to overcome this, uh, we, these weaknesses, we developed another version of our uh, application, which uses a full large language model um, on a GPU server. Um, so here also, uh, we uh, maintain the privacy and security of the user data because we still have a local uh, instance of the model. And it's relatively faster than the quantized version, but uh, still uh, slower uh, than the keyword and parsing based uh, versions of the application. Um, so, and also besides that, it's very resource intensive. Uh, and if the GPU is shared, which is the case uh, for us, uh, sometimes it may not be available. Um, so it's not always available. Um, and another limitation of this is that uh, setting it up can be quite time consuming and requires particular expertise. So uh, at least to overcome this last uh, weakness, we actually developed a Docker container uh, to package the software and dependencies uh, so that it's portable across different environments and also to future proof the application because it's possible that some of the dependencies, uh, I mean, new, when new versions become available, the older versions uh, stop uh, being distributed. Uh, but with this Docker container version, we can ensure that we will have all the dependencies that are required before uh, it's updated with newer versions and all. Um, so but, uh, so that uh, weakness um, is overcome, but still speed is a problem. And here I want to show a comparison of uh, three different versions. Uh, so here, first we have the quantized large language model on the CPU server. Uh, to generate a response from the time that the query was entered, it took on average one and a half minutes which is a really long time uh, for a user to wait and uh, wait for a response, especially if we want it to be real time. Um, for full LLM on GPU server, it was much better, 14 seconds, but still it's long enough wait for a response. But with graph matching on local machine, it was one and a half seconds. So within one and a half seconds on average, you get a response for that. Um, so right now, it looks like graph matching might be doing better than LLMs on in terms of time, but we know that uh, newer models are uh, becoming available. So it's possible that with uh, newer models and better hardware, uh, which is also going to follow since these large language models are uh, becoming a common thing now, uh, it should get better and more accessible. Uh, but uh, for now, since uh, this uh, the speed is a problem, uh, slower speeds, uh, we um, worry that slower speeds may actually contribute to the challenge of user adoption and engagement issues. Uh, they might get bored or they might think that it's not really working for them and they might not want to continue with the application. So that's why the approach that we have adopted right now is the layered pipeline where, which enables us to have that quick mode where just through, based on keyword matching, you can get a response. Um, sometimes it doesn't work or sometimes it might not be as accurate as the extended mode, but users have the uh, uh, capability to choose between the quick mode and extended mode. And then since it is their choice, 
um, and they uh, can be made aware of what the benefits and uh, um, ne uh, negative uh, shortcomings are of the two approaches. So that can help uh, keep the users engaged uh, into the application so that we could collect data and um, uh, develop the application and refine the application further. Um, and uh, so basically uh, that's uh, what we have done so far. Um, in terms of future directions, I had mentioned earlier that with users, um, uh, with uh, users with ADRD, uh, individuals who have ADRD, their uh, connections between uh, lexical items and the concepts get weaker, which result in um, a slower time to retrieve or uh, having difficulties in retrieving words. So we want to actually strengthen these connections. And for that, uh, currently there are some techniques that are adopted by um, professionals uh, to help individuals who have ADRD. For example, uh, semantic feature analysis, verb network strengthening treatments, and uh, queuing hierarchy treatment, et cetera. So one of our planned features now is to develop the training mode, which can utilize large language models, uh, generative models, as well as uh, other large language models like BERT, which can be leveraged to generate the content for uh, that could be used for uh, training, which is appropriate for each user based on the information in user-specific databases and their preferences. Uh, while leveraging these currently used techniques to identify the tasks that could be used for training uh, to strengthen the connections. Uh, besides that, uh, we want to continue with further refinements based on usability testing and iterative feedback. And also as newer large language models become available, we, we want to continue to experiment with those um, uh, to incorporate them into the application. Um, to conclude, um, I want to say that uh, artificial intelligence can play an important role in supporting individuals with ADRD. In case of our application, my words, the goals were to assist a user in finding a word um, he or she needs at a particular moment. And we want to train the user to better recall the word in the future. So expected impact of this on users' lives is that it would enhance their communication ability uh, resulting in reduction in uh, basically social isolation and uh, slower cognitive decline. So uh, large language models and other natural language processing uh, based technologies can be actually incorporated into such applications which uh, can play a role, for example, in this case, supporting individuals with decline in uh, language due to ADRD and uh, basically other dementias, basically uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias. Uh, that's it. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Bhartia. Uh, that was incredible. You, uh, you know, um, building an application that uses these new technologies and, and large language models as they're evolving uh, to support their word finding seems like a, a very significant uh, problem to solve because, uh, you know, um, social isolation and uh, the ability to communicate can have an impact uh, on the on the lives of the individuals with ADRD as well as like their family and their caregivers, right? And, and um, it's uh, the other in, uh, important thing to think through is that you had started your introduction with like exciting studies where like, you know, the executive function, as we know, is affected uh, in many of the types of dementia. And uh, what is interesting and, and um, hopefully we'll have more research to show that being able to uh, find the words and doing some of these uh, training using my words can actually slow cognitive decline. And that, that sounds like a really uh, a very promising approach. So uh, thank you very much. So are there uh, questions for Dr. Bhadia? I have a quick question. So uh, thank you for the presentation, the interesting work. So I'm curious, um, is there a data set, label data set, of uh, what are these words that people often forget? I'm curious, you know, like how do you go about evaluating how well a large language model or any other model does in getting the right word? Is there a sufficiently large data set that you can use to evaluate these? 
Uh, so um, I have not found a data set, uh, but I, um, yeah, so I haven't found a, such a data set, uh, which uh, already tells uh, what kind, like in what direction the language decline is going to happen. But we, there are some uh, studies uh, which uh, indicated that there are specific regions in the semantic networks that do get affected. Um, uh, so that was one of the things that we think we would like to, uh, like if we continue to develop this application and are able to collect data from users um, uh, who actually are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, we are hoping to collect data where we can, and we think that uh, we would like to see if it is possible to actually see uh, uh, categorize users based on the type of Alzheimer's uh, or um, or maybe the stage of Alzheimer's uh, disease that they have uh, that could indicate what what regions of the semantic network are getting affected for example is it people um, is it uh, objects or places or medications or what happens uh, with uh, like different um, if there might be, different kinds of dementias and they may be associated with different kind of uh, different areas in the semantic network that get affected as a result. So that's something that we would actually like to study uh, if that is possible. And uh, we think if we continue to develop and are able to collect data, then we uh, should be able to do that kind of an analysis and see if we can subcategorize uh, individuals based on the type of language that gets impacted. But right now, we uh, so I haven't found any publicly available or any data. And, uh, I haven't, I mean, it's possible, but I haven't found any mentions of such data sets that can be used to um, to uh, test the language models uh, based on that, whether they are able to retrieve well or not. But for now, while we do not have such data sets, there are some things that can be done. Uh, so in this application itself, for example, uh, we are collecting data from users in data entry mode. And over time, Alzheimer's progresses. So we already have the information about the user uh, in the database, and it's possible that as Alzheimer's proceeds uh, progresses, uh, they, st they start to forget some of that information. But then since we already have the gold data collected from the user in the base as a baseline, um, um, I mean, so we have some baseline data from them. Whatever stage they start using the application, that would be considered the baseline because from then on, it's a, I mean, it's expected that it would progress further. Um, so we can compare against that and the collect uh, the data that we have already collected. We could compare against that how well the large language models are able to uh, predict what the user uh, was looking for. But besides that, I think Sudeshna had once mentioned. Um, uh, in one of the meetings that we could actually also have di uh, dyads. So basically users uh, together with their, I mean, so individuals who have Alzheimer's together with their caregivers, because they might be able to also help us um, uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, the responses that these models are generating uh, to see how, because uh, the caregivers might have uh, even if the users themselves are not able to provide us with the data or an assessment that this is a good response or not, uh, the caregivers might still have uh, knowledge about what the users are trying to say or are looking for and may be able to assess the models uh, for us. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varia. Uh, we uh, would like to move on to our second talk. And uh, if uh, others have questions uh, for Dr. Varia, either post on the Q&A or in the chat. Um, uh, so actually now, like there are a couple of, there's a question uh, both in the Q&A and uh, recommendation in the, um, in the chat. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. Our next talk right. which reached uh, um, Curtis, uh, take it away. Sure. Let me just share my screen here. All right. So you guys can see my screen? Okay. That's good. All right. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Rich Curtis. I work at, in product at, um, at Kinto. Um, 
and I'll just I have lots of slides here. So um, what does Kinto do or what did we do as a, uh, as and what do we do now as Ripple? So Kinto was a uh, support intervention for dementia caregivers. Um, and we focused on making sure that the uh, tools were accessible, engageable, um, and uh, most importantly, scalable. Um, so our, our thesis is that we can improve caregiver well-being, their confidence and effectiveness, and that uh, will result in lower costs of care uh, for payers and providers. Um, and just full disclosure, Kinto was acquired by Ripple Care in 2024, um, but the spirit of the work that we did um, under this grant lives on, and uh, we'll get to some of that in, in, in a bit. Okay, next slide. So the, uh, um, you know, we, we, our tagline was always human powered tech enabled. Um, and we focused heavily on, you know, the underpinnings of the uh, protocol intervention was that the, was the care coach. So our caregivers were paired with a care coach. Um, they participated in virtual live sessions with their coach and uh, a peer support group. And we also had a mobile application underpinning um, that uh, relationship, which provided a lot of the data that uh, we're talking about with those, uh, these AI applications. Um, and, you know, we're not just a hunch. Uh, we are an evidence-based intervention. Um, Kinto, you know, we received a, a, a substantial amount of federal SBIR grant funding. Um, and we, you know, our 2021 study uh, resulted in a lot of uh, caregiver reported improvements um, to things like their emotional health and, you know, their uh, uh, caregiver, their mastery of, of, uh, of their caregiving, you know, uh, processes and, and journey, um, reductions in anxiety, uh, reductions in uh, strain within their caregiver patient dyad. Um, and we, you know, we, um, so heavily evidence-based, we're, we're all about gathering data and understanding it. Um, and we did run in 2023, um, we did run what we think is the largest um, randomized control trial um, of dementia caregivers. With, and the data for that is uh, still preliminary, it's being evaluated, but it is uh, pretty promising. So what the things we focused on here for the, uh, the Mass AITC and the A2 Collective uh, grant um, were around three specific aims. Um, the first being uh, caregiver data cleaning. So we gather a lot of data from our caregivers, their chats with coaches, their uh, you know transcripts of their meetings with coaches, that sort of thing. Um, and we thought, oh, well, you know, LLMs are good with language, um, so we will uh, we'll try and use it to uh, help us clean the data uh, so that we can use it with various LLMs and still protect privacy. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, LLMs are terrible at this, um, which we'll get to in a, in a bit. Um, the second specific aim was around strain analysis. So mining the caregiver data for indications of, uh, you know, caregiver burden and strain. Um, typically those are gathered in a, in a clinical setting um, using assessments, um, you know, like uh, surveys that you ask the caregiver to take. Um, if you've ever been to the, you know, the doctor's office, they're always making you fill out forms. And so if you go to the neurologist, um, you know, you're, you're uh, probably going to be asked to take these kind of surveys over and over. And we thought, oh, it would be really nice to have something that was directionally correct with, um, you know, to, to as a gauge for strain analysis, because our coaches, you know, that could be very useful for our coaches to know, um, you know, if this caregiver is under strain, we can help prioritize that sort of thing. And then resource recommendation was the third specific aim. So we wanted to understand if we could feasibly uh, deliver the right, you know, uh, local resource or, or regional resource to a, uh, or appropriate, just flat out appropriate resource to the caregiver at the right time, but depending on their, their situation, um, as we understood it from their data. And we'll get into the, the results of this stuff in a bit, but I wanted to under, I wanted to lay out what, how the protocol works. Uh, so you get a better sense of how much data we're, we're, we're collecting um, from caregivers. So the protocol uh, typically is six weeks of, uh, of the intervention period. And we call this the active, active coaching period. Uh, caregivers did stick around with Kinto for a lot longer than this, but um, the active coaching period was typically six weeks. Um, and it, it starts with an initial coaching session over a video conference with their coach. And then at the midway point, we do a, a check-in coaching session. And then at the end, we did another 
a, a final coaching session. Um, and this this uh, interaction, the first coaching session, um, focused on on um, you know helping understand the you know getting the coach to understand the the caregiver situation and help develop the preliminary action plan so that they could begin taking steps you know effective steps on their their journey um, along the way. Um, Peer support groups, big part of the Kinto, um, Kinto program. We would pair caregivers with, you know, 10 to 12 other caregivers who were going, you know, through the same sort of journey that they were on, um, potentially at different stages, um, which is always helpful. So you can have people who have been through what you're going through now, um, who can offer support and, um, you know, celebrate your wins and, you know, console your, your, uh, you know, when you're, when you're down. Um, and we themed those support groups every week with, um, you know, the, the themes you see at the bottom of the screen here, you know, around communication, how to respond to your loved ones with dementia, their behavior, you know, how to balance, you know, their safety and your independence and also their independence. And then also finally wrapping up with a, you know, a session on how to find meaningful activities that you can do with your, uh, with your loved one, um, you know, regardless of their stage in, in the disease, um, you know, and finding meaning in, in your journey. Uh, because as we all know, this uh, this uh, disease is terminal, and it uh, we can just they won't get better. So um, you know, understanding how you can you can um, you know find meaning in those in in, in that uh, kind of uh, context is is, is important. Um, and then the ongoing support that we provided is underpinned by the technology in the the Kinto mobile app and our and our platform. And those were you know one to one caregiver chat. Um, which I'll show you in a second, um, between the caregiver and their coach. Uh, support group chat, we have an online forum where the, uh, uh, the support group can chat amongst themselves, as well as tools in the app for um, action planning and, and education, resource sharing, um, as, as well as uh, uh, data storage and, and uh, our capsules, which uh, you know, we use for day-to-day um, -day caregiver kind of you know, tracking of um, important events. So as you can see, we uh we gather a lot of data from uh from this uh whoops went too far forward um and the outcomes of this this uh uh intervention were were, were very good right so um, strong consumer appeal uh, we had a 94 on our NPS uh, study consistently which is a big number that we like to brag about because no one ever sees numbers that high in consumer applications um, and uh, you know our uh, our uh, our engagement numbers were off the charts as well. Um, you know, uh, we had people stick around for for multiple years in support groups, build really strong connections among their support groups, and they're you know being able to uh, to really uh, you know help uh, guide those caregivers you know over the long the long haul because these you know the disease lasts uh, you know for many years. You know, typically on average, I think seven um, between uh, you know diagnosis and and uh, eventual death. So. Um, you know, this is a long journey, and so we 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 were um, glad to see that, that that we had this kind of engagement. Okay, so getting on to the technology, um, so you can see how we gathered this data. Um, so the Kinto mobile app uh, was iOS and Android. Um, we are rebranding it as the Ripple mobile app, so that's in progress. So stay tuned on that. Um, but you can see here that uh, you know we were um, you know our, our, our mantra of usable, flexible accessible and scalable. Scalable is the most important. Um, as you all know, um, you know, if you're if you're at all um, in, involved with dementia, um, we're looking at a, a, a tsunami of um, of you know uh, patients that are that are that are coming. I think it's uh, 12 to 14 million by 2040. Um, so there's a lot of of need for uh, tools like this that are scalable um, so that we can service those uh, those caregivers and and their their loved ones. Um, here's a picture of the um, information gathering, the data capsules that we uh, we employed, um, and these are tools that the uh, caregiver uses in, throughout the app to track things like appointments, medications, um, and this is showing the check in, which is a nice feature so that you can just on a daily basis, you know, you're prompted to complete a check in to track how your loved one is doing and also how you're doing as a caregiver, um, so that you can have a record of it. And a lot of our um, our caregivers use this feature as a as kind of a a, um, a journal 
um, to track their their progress throughout the um, the their you know their caregiving journey. And coach chat. Um, so here you can see the coach and the caregiver interacting. Um, you know the the benefit of this is that the asynchronicity of it. Um, the coach the caregiver can reach out to their coach at any time, day or night. And while the coach may not uh, be able to respond immediately, they will see it the next you know next business morning uh, when they can uh, get back to their to their caregiver um, or you know to their caregiver under their care. And uh, you know we had high engagement numbers, some of which you know went on for years with some of our caregivers. So similarly, support group chat. Uh, this is a, a great way for the caregivers to engage with uh, their peer support group um, and being able to reach out at any time and actually get responses from their support group in the middle of the night. Here's an example of a testimonial um, that we had. Um, and we have uh, lots of examples of things like this that happened um, in support groups. Um, action planning. So this is a big part of the intervention as well is to track, hey, I need to take these steps to, you know, understand things like I need to explore long-term, you know, uh, care options for my loved one, or I need to understand how to get legal advice or all, all sorts of, uh, you know, interpersonal and, and uh, you know, um, across the spectrum of, of caregiving concerns um, so that, that, that the caregiver can have something that's tailored to their use case. They develop this with their coach and they, um, you know, uh, you can see that 97% of them made progress against their goals. And then our, our uh, education uh, was a big part of our, of our protocol. Being able to educate caregivers on, you know, caring for yourself is important, as well as things like home safety, um, how to, you know, uh, deal with the understand and deal with the progression of the, the disease, um, and all of these, uh, you know, similar caregiving subjects were captured in the Kenta mobile app, and they could um, they could uh, review them at their leisure. And here's a a uh, shot of the uh, the Kinto portal where the uh, the coach can you know see their their caregivers um, that they're under their care and um, reach in and take action uh, against you know each one of them um, over time. So so that's how we got a lot of this data is through this app through our our uh, video session and now what did we do with it right? So um, our um, you know uh, overriding mantra is that we want to build you know innovative AI based applications. And build the best data set on, you know, focused on uh, caregivers of people living with dementia. So, you know, we were working on this virtual virtuous cycle here where, you know, we gather data and we, um, you know, are fine tuning it and, and using it to, uh, to generate um, output that is used in, in our applications. Um, we were the first health tech startup that was approved for OpenAI's HIPAA infrastructure. Um, which is, uh, and uh, we're also an NIH and um, AITC uh, grant recipient. So on the, the um, actual uh, specific aims, um, so our first uh, idea was that we would use uh, LLMs, specifically, uh, you know, OpenAI, since we're on their HIPAA uh, compliant infrastructure um, to clean some of our data for us. And uh, in hindsight, uh, this was obviously a terrible idea uh, because the uh, LLMs are too slow, they're expensive, they make mistakes, and are going to insert hallucinated data into your into your data set, which is not at all what you want if you're going to trust your data for use elsewhere. So uh, we wound up going with a package called Scrub-a-Dub, which is um, kind of a, a red a red regex based uh, tool that is used widely in in healthcare, um, and it's much faster and cheaper and and produce better results. So it was uh, a good learning for us. Uh, that uh, if you are going to rely on your sensitive data uh, to be, you know, to be clean, don't use an LLM to do it. Um, specific aim two, uh, much better results on this. So our, um, you know, we, we, our, our goal here was to use the data that we collected to mine, you know, to mine it. Here's our little, our little miner with his pickaxe um, to, uh, you know, find indications of strain. Um, and we, the way that you typically do this in a clinical setting is to, um, 
you know, ask the caregiver uh, to take a survey and you ask them again the next time you see them and you ask them again the next time you see them. And that becomes a burden and people get fatigued just from taking surveys. So we thought, oh, we have all this data. We can use it as a proxy for these surveys. And what we wound up doing was um, actually asking it to uh, go through each one of the questions in, a, in one of these uh, standardized surveys and look for indications in our data set for that caregiver that uh, indicated that they, you know, what, what they might answer um, and then provide a score for that. Um, and our, you know, we looked at this through the lens of feasibility, right? Is it feasible for us to use these off the shelf tools without much bespoke software engineering to, you know, generate, um, you know, something that's directionally correct that we can use to prioritize how, you know, which caregivers need the most attention, um, you know, next basically. Um, and so we, we, we found that it was feasible. Um, we did another experiment where we asked it to adopt the caregiver's persona, but that was, um, in my opinion, a little, a little weird. And, uh, um, we didn't, we didn't delve too much in, into that. Um, and then on specific game three, which is around resource recommendation, um, you know, our goal being to provide the right resource to the right, you know, caregiver at the right time. Um, and these are things that. Uh, you know, caregivers often ask their coaches for help finding, um, you know, local resources on the web or things like understanding the disease or, hey, I need to find respite care. I need I need a break or I need to find daycare for my loved one. Um, you know, those are the types of things that are are um, fragmented across the country. But we've built up a pretty big corpus of those resources. And we thought, oh, we'll use, um, you know, we'll put those into a, a, a vector database. And ask the AI to, um, you know, knowing what it knows about the caregiver, you know, giving it the, that context to pick the right resource um, that, you know, from the ones that the, came out of the the uh, rag store you know, that are semantically uh, similar. Um, and uh, we found that this was feasible. We, we you know, we um, we went looking through all of the results that we got and went and found. Oh, they did ask for something like this, and it did um, provide them with that, you know, a similar or, you know, relevant resource for that uh, use case. Um, and then, you know, being a product, <clears throat> excuse me, being a product company, we wanted to, you know, start to build on these. And so one of the major use cases that we had was summarization, right? So we wanted to be able to summarize a, a caregiver situation in a quick and easy way so that the that the caregiver, the coach can look at the record of the caregiver and say, oh, I recognize you know what their situation is. I don't have to parse through all of this data. It's presented to me in an easy, easy to understand, you know, way. And then, you know, our goal again is to have this this virtuous summarization cycle under the thesis that the more off analysis that we can offload to the AI, the more caregivers that we can serve. And think about that, you know, twelve to fourteen million number that's that's coming. Um, you know, that 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 was always in our in our minds that uh, there's a lot of people who are going to need this, and it isn't feasible to do it just manually. There aren't enough social workers um, who can be coaches in the world um, to do it. So um, here's an example of uh, the <clears throat> the caregiver summary. This has been scrubbed, so it's it's okay to show you guys. Um, and you can see on the left, uh, you know, the summary of the person living with dementia, some of their, uh, you know, situation like their residence and, and their, you know, what, what family members they have, you know, who, um, you know, are there any <clears throat> cognitive changes? Their relationship to their caregiver and um you know then information on the caregiver and their situation as well as down here at the bottom a narrative summary of of their situation and the scores that they got on the the formal assessments that we that we tried to do um so we found that this was you know really interesting to pull this together and that the the um lms did a, a really good job excuse me they did a really good job, you know, summarizing this information um, and, and you know, our coaches would review and they never really found anything that was, uh, you know, too egregious of a hallucination, um, you know, in these, these use cases. Obviously, more quality control is needed for things like this, but, um, you know, for our purposes for this, this grant um, experiments, we, we were pretty pleased with the results. <clears throat> Here's an application for, you know, breakdown of how our 
our uh, recommendation a recommendation engine works. So we gather our resources, we put them into a a vector store, so we can um, when provided the the caregiver data set, it pulls up the semantically relevant uh, um, resources that it finds. We hand those to the uh, to the AI and say, you know, pick the best one for this re this caregiver, uh, given what you know, and then present the recommendation to the coach. So they can use it or not use it, right? We're big believers in having a human in the loop anytime there's uh, input coming from an AI. Uh, we don't want to just uh, unleash it on humans um, without people, um, you know, reviewing it. And we'll skip this slide because it's not relevant. So in conclusion, um, our perspective is that, you know, we need to do this foundational work to begin with to understand if applications like this are feasible for our purposes and whether they can they can scale. Um, and, uh, you know, we believe that since this is a sensitive context that any AI output, output will need to be overseen by qualified human beings uh, before being passed on to the caregiver or any other human, um, simply because, especially in a healthcare or, you know, quasi healthcare context like caregiving for people with dementia, um, these are, you know, we the last thing you want to do is give someone terrible advice from an, an LLM. Um, and then we believe that eventually these systems will need less and less human supervision. And, uh, you know, we can iterate towards um, towards getting there. But, uh, you know, we're, we're well towards the bottom of this pyramid, in our opinion. So I'll stop there um, just to give you a sense of what we did um, at Kinto um, and what the, you know, the work that we're going to be doing um, also at Ripple. So uh, thank you. For your time I'm happy to take any questions yeah thank you thank you Rich. that was that was wonderful and giving us an oversight but also you know um help, uh, allow us and encourage us to be cautiously optimistic and putting the appropriate you know human oversight and uh, uh, guardrails in place before we uh, you know uh, go through with this uh, kind of uh, technology so thank you so much and we are almost at the top of the hour but uh, maybe one question if someone has a burning one I can ask again so i have a quick question rich uh, did for any of your work did you manage to did you fine tune the models i'm curious if you had to fine tune if you fine tune the model for example for the data cleaning would it have done better no we 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 did not our our thesis was that we wanted to see how the off the shelf you know foundational models worked um so we went with gpt4 since we were on the hipaa compliant infrastructure it was safe for us to do that um but yeah i would caution against the um using an LLM to clean your data, it is, uh, you know, it's expensive, it's slow. And, uh, you know, we found 100% of errors. Every single data file we ran through the thing had some hallucination somewhere in it, which is just not, you know, acceptable, right? It, it just, it was, it was, it, it, it fell right on its face, basically. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Yeah. Well, thank you. Alrighty, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're Great. off for the summer, but um, we appreciate both the speakers. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to connect, connect with us or um, feel free to look up the speakers on their LinkedIn. Um, and it, you can reach out to us and we can provide contact information as necessary. Thank you, everyone.